well, let's get started now. Um, thank you everyone for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm gonna introduce to you here um, our new platform for the generation of double emulsions uh, dedicated for uh, fax, uh, fax technology sorting. Uh, we will review uh, our platform and then uh, I will talk to you about a case study we did, uh, which was the encapsulation of fluorescent bacteria for uh, sorting using fax technology. So uh, let's get started with a brief context of what is uh, fax technology. Fax stands for fluorescence activated cell sorting, and it's a technique to uh, to purify specific cell populations, so to select uh, specific cells among a complex population based on uh, their phenotypes. And this technology relies on uh, flow cytometry analysis. Um, <clears throat> this technology is a single cell technology. This means that uh, you will analyze in the population each cell individually and have information about, about uh, the characteristics of each uh, cell. Uh, in addition, it's a very accurate technology with multi-parameters, so you can, uh, you have various possibilities for discrimin discriminating cells uh, based on the size, the size, their complexity, and uh, several fluorescence parameters that can be for uh, protein secretion or any specific phenotypes. Um, about the limitations of this technology, the first thing that uh, uh, is important to know is that um, this is a single cell analysis, but there is, uh, but this is done on a bulk assay, which means that you might have some cell to cell interactions. Uh, cell communi communicating with the, each other. So if you're looking, for example, at some specific molecule secretion of cells, uh, it may be influenced by the communication between the cells and not due to your specific uh, bioassay. Uh, secondly, uh, in some cases, this technology necessitates to use uh, fix fixating chemicals uh, especially for molecule secretion analysis. And these chemicals are uh, very damaging for the cells. So if you try to uh, sort your cells of interest, in some cases, you might have uh, collect dead cells and you cannot perform further analysis on them. Um, so in this case, why is it interesting to combine uh, fax technology with droplet microfluidics? Here, droplet microfluidics can serve as a sample preparation for uh, the sorting using fax. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, fax will rely, uh, will analyze the size, granulosity, or fluorescence uh, parameters uh, of your cells. Uh, but it, it can be incompatible with the detection of protein, metabolite, or molecule secretion. Uh, because it requires uh, either it requires uh, chemicals or your produced uh, metabolite will be secreted in the uh, in the surrounding media and the signal you want to analyze will be lost. Uh, encapsulating uh, your cells to be sorted inside uh, droplets can be used for, uh, to, to perform before the sorting single cell cultivation, to, uh, to perform specific uh, bioassays, such as uh, specific fluorescence-based detection, cell-to-cell -cell interaction. And if I can give you a quick example, we can have a look on uh, the sorting, the case of sorting bacteria based on its enzymatic activity. So imagine, you have here um, a bacteria that you want to sort, and you want it to be sorted depending on whether or not it secretes a specific enzyme. Here, you will encapsulate it with uh, a specific substrate. And uh, if, the if the bacteria here secretes uh, the enzyme of interest, 
the enzyme will bind to the, to the substrate and form uh, a complex. And after digestion of uh, the substrate, there will be a release of, of a fluorescent compound. Now, if you're not inside a microbiome reactor, your fluorescent compound will just flow everywhere and gets diluted in your surrounding media and you will lose your signal. By confining it inside the microbiome reactor, you concentrate the signal inside your droplet and you're able to really determine uh, that these bacteri bacteria in particular uh, secretes your molecule. Uh, so there's a need uh, for fax, uh, some fax sorting application uh, for a compartmentalization method inside a microbiome reactor. Now, why uh, double emulsions? Um, if we have a look at uh, simple uh, water in oil emulsion, we can think that maybe it would be enough uh, as simple preparation for fax sorting. So let's take this case. So you have droplets of uh, water, probably water-based, probably um, culture media, and it's surrounded by a continuous uh, flow of uh, oil. So the encapsulation will go, uh, well, it will go well. Uh, your cell will remain viable because it's in culture media. Your body, your assay, uh, given that you're in the proper conditions, will be perfectly fine. It will work. But when it comes to sorting, you will have difficulties uh, sorting the droplets using fax technology uh, because your surrounding media is oil and cannot, uh, cannot be used for sorting because it cannot be charged. Now, uh, this method uh, won't fit. Let's look at the other kind of simple emulsions, which are oil and water uh, emulsions. Here you will have your droplets containing oil and your aqueous media will be the surrounding uh, the surrounding media. Your encapsulation here will work fine as well. And uh, your sorting will work because here you will have your continuous flow, most likely PBS, uh, which, which can be charged and then can be sorted. However, uh, since you, the content of your droplet is made of oil, your cell won't remain viable for long in most cases, and your bioassay most likely won't work fine. So that's not an option either. Now, if we have a look at the double emulsion water in oil in water, uh, we can see that the um, core phase of your droplet will be of aqueous media, most likely uh, your uh, culture media. Uh, you will have a shell surrounding it made of oil to protect it. And you will have your external media, which will be probably PBS. In this case, uh, you're able uh, to encapsulate your cells inside to you, you're able to cultivate your cells so that they remain viable to do your bioassay and it will be compatible with uh, fax sorting because your surrounding media would be aqueous media. So uh, this is why uh, there's a necessity for double emulsions. Now, uh, if we want to make a double emulsion um, system uh, that would be compatible uh, with fax sorting, we needed to, uh, to have some uh, features uh, to, to answer to some features, specific features that will make it compatible. Uh, so uh, the first thing that we want is that uh, you, the size of the double emulsions that you generate are compatible with uh, the, fax, uh, the fax technology. In the fax technology, you have a nozzle that can be of several diameters. Uh, in most cases, it will, it will range between 75 micrometers and maybe in some cases 250 or 300 micrometers. Uh, so you might have to generate double emulsions with a very much reduced uh, diameter down sometimes to 20 microns. Secondly, you want a very good monodispersity of your generated double emulsions. 
This is important because, uh, as I mentioned previously, with facts, uh, with flow cytometry, you discriminate your populations, often based on uh, the size. Uh, so the, be the better your monodispersity is, the more concentrated your population will be uh, on your flow cytometry graph, and the most easy to identify your populations will be. Uh, you might as well want um, an oil shale uh, of your double emulsion uh, rather thin uh, to avoid sedimentation inside your tube and to allow a good uh, flow inside your fax machine uh, so that you have uh, an easy sorting. Also, you want a system that will be a reproducible that will allow you to generate always the same size of double emulsions and you want it to not be too much time consuming when you want to sort cell populations using fax technology you often want to sort among populations of like a uh, hundred thousand uh, of um, of double emulsions so you want to generate high numbers of double emulsions rapidly If we have a look at the conventional double emuls emulsification method uh, that we can uh, find in publication on the market, we can distinguish two main methods. The first one would be a bulk method where, uh, that relies on vortexing uh, a tube containing two immiscible uh, phases. So most likely you will have a phase of water and a phase of oil. And you will vortex, uh, agitate uh, strongly the, the content of the tube. So this is a method that is rather easy to do uh, and that will allow you to generate high volumes of double emulsions. However, you will have a very high size diameter dispersion of your double emulsions and this won't be reproducible. You will not control the generation of the double emulsions using this method. Uh, and also the encapsulation of biological materials will be difficult. You will not be able to perform single cell encapsulation. For example, if you want to do this, you will not be able to control the encapsulation rate of your biological compound. Um, so in the last 10, 15 years, uh, a new method emerged, which is the microfluidic method. And this relies um, on the successive uh, encapsulation. First, uh, the encapsulation of water in oil, and then the encapsulation of the first droplet inside another water phase. Um, the advantages of this technology is that um, the monodispersity that you will have it is much better. You will have a real good uh, monodispersity in comparison to bulk uh, method. Uh, and um, you will have a better control of your encapsulation of bi biological materials. So basically, this is a method where, where you control uh, things better. But this is something that is difficult to handle, and it necessitates to uh, the design and fabrication of rather complicated microfluidic chips in PDMS. Uh, it's, uh, it requires as well complex surface treatment, as you can see here for the generation of water in oil droplets. Uh, you will need one specific uh, surface coating, which can be hydrophilic, for example, uh, well, mostly hydrophobic. And for the encapsulation of oil in water uh, droplets, you will need uh, hydrophilic treatment. So you, you necessitate several surface treatment, which is quite difficult to, uh, to make and which uh, gives a rather bad reproducibility. Uh, in addition, when you want to uh, generate double emulsions using this method, it's very, the production is very slow. So you, you might not uh, go higher than uh, 500 droplets uh, per second, which is rather slow. 
So you might want a more rapid method when you want to generate large volume of double emulsions. Now, uh, let's have a look at what we propose here. We propose uh, a double emulsion platform. So we worked on this with our partner Sequoia, uh, who designed the, the platform and the microfluidic chip for the generation of double emulsion. And this platform integrates uh, fluid gens, uh, fluid handling uh, products. Um, this platform uh, was set for the generation of uh, double emulsions and the encapsulation of biological compounds inside this double emulsion for fax applications. So uh, you have four possibilities for generating your double emulsions uh, with various uh, microfluidic chip that will have different uh, nozzle sizes and that will allow you to generate different uh, droplet sizes. So here, for example, you have a ray drop, uh, which is the name of the device, uh, with a configuration of 30 micrometers here for uh, the core phase, uh, 70 micrometers for the shell phase here, and 45 for the output uh, counter nozzle. And that will allow you to generate 25 or 20, 245 diameter double emulsions. Now you can have other models that will allow you to get to go up to 90 micrometers double emulsions. Uh, I'll come back to, to the ray drop a bit uh, later. Um, this platform, in comparison to other methods that uh, I, uh, I talked about previously, um, it answers all the drawbacks that we saw. Um, for example, uh, it will allow an excellent monodispersity and with an excellent reproducibility. Since you already have one chip, which is not made in PDMS, you, you have a commercial chip that is uh, really reliable and that will give you a really good reproducibility. You do not need surface treatment as well. Uh, and uh, it allows the generation of up to uh, 10,000 of droplets per second that can be like 10 to 20 times faster than conventional uh, chips that you will find in, um, in articles. Uh, so what is important, the main advantage of this platform is that it's really time saving. Uh, with this platform, um, wh when you want to combine uh, double emulsions with fax technologies, uh, from experience you, with conventional technologies, if you want to generate one condition, it will often take you like half a day, maybe one day uh, to generate a few hundreds uh, of microliters of emulsions. Here you can generate like 15 different conditions a day of uh, 500 microliters uh, of emulsion. So it's really a huge gain uh, of time. Also, this platform is all integrated uh, and it's all ready to use. So even for uh, people who are used to fax technologies but do not really know well microfluidics and how to generate double emulsions, this is rather easy to handle. If we have a look at the platform a little bit more in details, you can see that, as I mentioned, this is an integrated platform and it's, um, it comprises several modules. So uh, the first module that, that uh, you will see is the microfluidic chip, which is the ray drop designed by our partner Sequoia. And that allows you to generate uh, the double emulsions in, in a very reproducible manner. Uh, so this uh, chip here is placed in, a, in an optical module that will allow you to follow the, the generation of your double emulsions in life to make sure that uh, your uh, gen uh, production of droplets is stable and that you have the, the right size. Um, all, this, uh, all this droplet production is handled by uh, our uh, 
power flow handling uh, devices, which are uh, the FlowEasy, which are integrated here. Uh, and that will pressurize the reservoir here containing all the solutions that you want to encapsulate. So here you will have your continuous flow, here your shell phase, which is oil, and here you will have uh, your, uh, your water phase, uh, the core phase uh, of your double emulsion. Um, as you can notice here, there is as well uh, free gent devices. Uh, which is actually uh, an L switch and that we call an injection loop. This injection loop here is very important. It allows you to, uh, to inject your biological uh, compounds at the closest to your microfluidic chip. Uh, this, uh, this aims, uh, this is interesting to, to use when you want to encapsulate very small volume of biological compounds, because sometimes you have um, a population of rather rare cells, so you don't have much volume, or you want to, to inject some uh, cells extracted from mice, for example, and you know that you cannot have a lot of cells. So when you have very small volumes here, you will have an injection loop that can be of uh, several vo uh, small volumes, and that will allow you to not flow your biological samples through all the fluidic path here and to avoid to to avoid a high dead volume uh, also it avoids the the contamination of all your fluidic path by injecting it really just before the microfluidic chip so you might not have contamination here in this area and uh, this is good when you want to uh, make a serial encapsulation of several uh, cellular species. Um, if we have a better look at this injection loop, uh, we propose several uh, injection loops of 50, 100, or 200 microliters. So it's really designed for small volumes. And as I mentioned, it avoid the contamination of the core fluidic path. And also, since you can inject your biological uh, sample at the very last moment, right when you want to encapsulate it, uh, this will avoid cellular sedimentation. How does it work? Here you have the interface of your injection loop, and you have a special connector when you can uh, inject your biological sample using a simple syringe. On your, uh, on your injection loop, you have two positions. One will be to load your biological sample inside the loop, and the other one will be to inject the content of the loop inside uh, the microfluidic chip. If we have uh, a look at um, the schematics of the circuit here, you have uh, your, core, uh, your core phase, so you have your a pressure controller that will pressurize a tube here contain, containing your core phase, which is usually water or culture media, which is uh, the tube here. Uh, your phase will flow uh, towards a flow meter that will uh, measure the, the flow rate of your, of your phase, and it will reach as a microfluidic chip, and you will start making double emulsions uh, with your core phase. As you can see here, there is your injection loop, and this is uh, where you will inject your biological sample. So while you're generating your double emulsions here of water or culture media, you will load your loop uh, on position two here. And when then you want to inject your biological uh, sample, you just switch your loop uh, to the other position and the content of your loop here will be injected uh, in, the, in the microfluidic chip. So you will start to encapsulate your biological compound. Um, I can show you here how it works, maybe uh, a bit more in details. So here, 
you have uh, your core phase arriving and exiting here towards the microfluidic chip. And in, and in the meantime, when you start to inject uh, your biological compound here, it will be injecting, injected here and flow all the way, as you can see, through uh, the injection loop here, which is a 200 microliter injection loop, and it will flow out to the waste. When you see uh, the flow coming out here, it means that your injection loop is filled. Now you can just uh, remove your, your syringe and your needle. And then you can switch uh, your, the, the loop to the other position. Now, in this position, the flow coming here from the core phase will enter the system here, and it will push the content on the injection loop here, and that will then flow outside of the system towards the microfluidic chip like this. Here. So as you can see, that's uh, very convenient uh, and very easy to use. And that will really allow you to encapsulate your biological material without having to think about, oh, I have a small volume. Uh, there's a risk of cellular sedimentation. So that's really useful for this. Now, let's uh, see a practical case that we did uh, in collaboration with uh, the Toulouse uh, White Biotechnology and the Toulouse Biotechnology Institute. Uh, along with uh, Sequoia, our, our partner, of course. Um, what, uh, what we did here, we followed a workflow for the encapsulation of fluorescent E. coli inside double emulsion, and then the sorting of, uh, the, of these double emulsions uh, using fax technology. Uh, this workflow, basically, there was a step of cell preparation that was prepared by the biologists working uh, at the TWB and, uh, and at TBI. Then we performed uh, an encapsulation of the bacteria uh, inside the double emulsions. We checked uh, the, the monodispersity and the encapsulation of the bacteria using microscopy. Then there was a cell sorting using fax technology and uh, post-sorting analysis using microscopy as well to make sure that the sorting worked efficiently. In some cases, in most cases, you want to make a, a further cell study after the sorting, which was not the case here. What we wanted to do was, uh, uh, was the proof of concept of the encapsulation and the efficient cell sorting. Um, I would like to thank a lot uh, the people from uh, TWB and TBI uh, for their time and their availability to perform this uh, case study together. So two main goals here, the easy, rapid and stable encapsulation of the fluorescent E. coli in the double emulsions, and then the compatibility of the double emulsions with facts for an efficient sorting. Uh, so let's have a look at the bacterial encapsulation in the double emulsion. So the, the bacterial culture was prepared previously, and we used the injection loop to, um, to start encapsulating uh, this uh, fluorescent bacteria. So as you can see here, we are at the um, produ production, um, a production step. So you have the nozzle here of the ray drop. We selected the ray drop model 30, 70, 45, which, which means that for uh, the, phase, the core phase containing the fluorescent uh, E. coli, we had 30 micrometers. For the oil shale, uh, we had 70 microliters, um, micrometers, sorry. And for the output counter nozzle, we had 45 micrometers. It allowed us to generate droplets with a diameter uh, con between 20 and 40 micrometers. Um, the use of, um, of our um, pressure-based, um, well, pressure generators uh, allowed us to have a very stable flow 
with very stable pressure and measured flow rate. And that allowed us to generate very monodispersed double emulsions. Uh, if uh, you use, for example, syringe pumps, you will have something very polydispersed and uh, it, won't, it wouldn't be compatible uh, with fax sorting or not as much. Um, here you have the continuous phase that will, uh, that, which is necessary for the production of uh, your double emulsion. It will squeeze your core and shell phases in, in, into double emulsions here. And you can see here inside the capillary uh, in the ray drop uh, that we have rather monodispersed double emulsions and that we're generated, generating a lot of double emulsions. Uh, the production rate could be up to 10,000 uh, droplets per second. So we're really generating in 30 minutes, uh, uh, like 500 microliters of double emulsions. Uh, concerning the time, it took, as I mentioned, 30 minutes. Um, when we arrived in Toulouse, uh, the, um, the platform was delivered. It took us like two hours to unbox it and to install it on the bench. And then when we wanted to start an experiment, so the setup and chip priming took around 30 minutes. And then the bacterial encapsulation took another 30 minutes to encapsulate a few hundred microliters. Uh, samples. Um, in total, it takes one hour, but if you want to encapsulate in series several uh, biological samples, it will take you each time an additional 30 minutes, which is really fast. And that's why you can make 10 to 15 conditions in a single day. Now, after generating the um, the double emulsions, uh, we had, we did a microscopic observation uh, of, uh, of these double emulsions. As you can see here, uh, you have, uh, you can see the presence of bacteria in many droplets with some that contain no bacteria. And you can see the, fluor the green fluorescent signal uh, in, uh, in a lot of droplets. Uh, by playing with the flow rates, you will encapsulate more or less equally. The goal here was not to do single cell encapsulation. It was just to have several kinds of uh, populations. So we distinguish the three kinds here, uh, drop, empty droplets uh, with no bacteria. Here, droplets that seem to contain bacteria, but with no fluorescence. And here, droplets that contain e fluorescent E. coli here. Um, concerning, we did a small measurement of a few dozens of, of double emulsions, and uh, we noticed that uh, we have a double emulsion mean diameter of 34 uh, micrometers with a coefficient of variation of 2%, which means it's uh, really monodispersed. Um, so, uh, by analyzing uh, these double emulsions using microscopy, we noticed that it seemed to be uh, ready for uh, sorting using fax technology because the size and monodispersity fits the needs. Now, uh, concerning fax sorting, we use the Moflo Atrio Seculizer cell sorter uh, from the um, cytometry platform of the uh, Toulouse uh, White Biotechnology. And uh, the first step was to use flow cytometry to determine the population of interest, the population that we wanted to sort. So there was first a droplets identification. So which in the, in the flow cytometry graph uh, was identified as droplets. Then uh, doublet exclusion to select really single uh, droplets. And then uh, the identification of which droplets uh, are fluorescent and which aren't. From this graph, we decided to perform two sortings. One of them would be uh, sorting only the droplets that seem to have a fluorescent signal. And the other one was to sort only the droplets that seem to have a low or no fluorescent signal. Um, it is to be noted that uh, this cell sorter 
gives an estimation of the sorting efficiency. And the value displays, displayed was around 85% uh, of sorting efficiency, which is, uh, which is very good. Now, after the sorting, we observed the produced double emulsion in microscopy again to verify the content of the, of the collected uh, populations. As you can see in the sorting uh, where we were targeting the, the droplets with no fluorescent signal, we can find two populations. The first one uh, here would be empty droplets. And the second one would be droplets that seem to contain bacteria, but which are not fluorescent. And in the other sorting where we were targeting the, um, uh, the droplets, double emulsions, that display the fluorescent signal, we can see that in all of them, it seems that we have fluorescence with various intensities, but in all of them, it seems that there, are, there is a fluorescence. It is important to note that in the double emulsions here with no fluorescent signal, we, are, we collect the ones with uh, bacteria that are not fluorescent because in, when you have complex bacterial populations, some of them, will be fluorescent, uh, some of them won't be fluorescent, and you do not want, you want to really target the bacteria of interest and to leave, uh, to send to the waste the other bacteria. So it's really important to note that we are able to discriminate the fluorescent bacteria from the non-fluorescent bacteria. Uh, this demonstrated that uh, the, fluor the, the fax, uh, the sorting using fax technology uh, on double emulsions was very efficient. Now, if we have a look back at the um, workflow we followed, here's the cell encapsulation. Uh, it was very, it was rapid and we were able to generate easily uh, high volumes of double emulsions. Then we were able to uh, make a microscopy analysis of the size, monodispersity and encapsulation of uh, this, uh, generated double emulsions. We performed uh, a cell sorting uh, quite easily using uh, the cell sorter. And then the post sorting analysis allowed us to confirm that the sorting went well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do not perform further cell study. So uh, in conclusion, we were able well, to perform an easy and rapid encapsulation uh, with a system that was really time saving. So um, it is to be noted that um, uh, they have, uh, they were already trying to make um, droplet sorting using fax technology, double emulsion sorting, but they had uh, issues with the generation of double emulsions uh, in Toulouse because uh, they were using two steps uh, PDMS chips and it was taking them like two days to have uh, maybe two different conditions. And sometimes it took them up to the entire week uh, for their uh, double emulsion generation and uh, bacterial encapsulation. So by using our system, it was really a huge uh, gain of time because what they were doing in two to five days, we could do it in like half to one day, maybe at worst. So it was, well, and even in two hours. So it was really a huge gain of time. Now, uh, thank you uh, for attending this webinar. Thank you for uh, your attention during my presentation. Now, if you have uh, any question, feel free to ask, uh, to ask uh, on the question and answer. Uh, we will be happy to, to answer them. So uh, we already have a question. Uh, so which is, uh, well, interesting talk. So thank you very much for this. And what is the material uh, of the red drop? So uh, the red drop nozzle uh, can be made of resin or glass, depending on uh, your needs. Uh, resin will allow you to work with all uh, oils and uh, aqueous media with uh, isopropanol, ethanol, but for some specific, um, for some specific reagents, it can be incompatible. So we're also proposing 
uh, a version with glass nozzles. Um, okay, so let's, the first one was from Christina. Uh, thank you for your question. So you said during the formation of the double emulsion in the experiment you made, why did you use a continue, as continuous phase uh, H2 uh, well, water with 2% twin 20 instead of using uh, water alone. Um, okay, the reason here is to avoid coalescence of your double emulsions. Uh, the twin 20 here acts uh, as a surfactant. Uh, so it's necessary to, to add some. Uh, it won't bring difficulties for the generation of the double emulsions, but it's required. Otherwise, you might have coalescence of your droplets. Uh, you asked another question that was, if the sorting is incorporated in the microchip in tandem with the production of the droplet, is also necessary to make double emulsion or is possible to work with water in oil droplets? Um, so if the sorting, um, well, if the sorting is, in, is incorporated in the microchip, which is not uh, the case with the ray drop, um, well, it might. It depends on uh, on the sorting method. Actually, if it's based on the generation of an electric field, uh, water in oil will most likely not work uh, for for the same reason that I mentioned earlier. Uh, when you apply an electric charge, uh, if it's uh, if it's in oil, it will probably not work. Uh, so I I still recommend double emulsion, but that really depends on your sorting method, actually. Um, if you have a specific thing in mind, you can. Uh, come back to us and we can discuss your application more in detail. Uh, but thank you for your questions. Now, uh, we have uh, uh, Vincent asking, what is a dissolved surfactant? Uh, the dissolved surfactant is um, basically it's um, surfactant in oil. So it's fluorine fluorinated oil with um, proprietary uh, surfactant. Uh, it's uh, it's oil with a molecule inside that prevents the coalescence uh, of your droplets. If you do not have uh, this surfactant, your droplets will merge with each other and you will not be able to generate your double emulsion. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, Douglas, uh, you said, and thank you for your question. I hope our system, uh, your system is coming with the injection loop. So yes, actually you have two options. You can order the system with the loop, but uh, we, put it, we put it in option because uh, some people might not want the loop and might not require it depending on their needs. Uh, so we're leaving the possibility to buy the system with or without the loop. Uh, depending on, uh, on your needs and what you want. Now, uh, we have Sunda asking, and thank you for your question. In the post-sorting analysis image, there are some smaller tiny droplets. What are they? What is the percentage of droplets that break and get mixed uh, with outer aqueous phase? Okay, so that's, that is um, a really good question. Um, so if we have a look. Oof. Okay, I need to do this. Okay, if we have a look um, at this uh, smaller droplet, um, there are probably some uh, small residues of this uh, that can detach and make small uh, small populations. They won't. Uh, have an impact on your cell sorting, but they might get trapped when um, when you sort your populations. So in most cases, you will have them uh, in your, um, uh, well, you might have residues in your collected samples. Uh, but this is also due to fax technologies. 
uh, fax technologies, you will often have a lot of small residues in, uh, inside your sample. Uh, the percentage of, uh, of droplets that can break, and uh, if I get back to your question, it was what is the percentage of droplet that break and get mixed with outer aqueous phase? Uh, the percentage was not evaluated. Um, from what the cytometry and sorting experts told us, uh, it was a minority. Now it may depend on um, the shell thickness of your double emulsion. It may depend on um, how fast you pass your, drop, your double emulsion in the um, fax machine. So there are various parameters, but uh, most of the double emulsions remain uh, intact. Um, so we have an, uh, someone asking, what is the minimum size of the core phase that could be utilized? Uh, so the minimum size of the core phase was around 15 micrometers with a 20 micrometers for the global double emulsion. And you also asked, can you please give some more detailed information about the sorting device? Would the charge-based sorting influence the survivability of the bacteria in the double emulsion? Um, well, uh, the sorting device is a um, classical uh, fax uh, machine. So it's widely used for, for bacterial sorting and cell sorting. So as a charge uh, is not supposed to influence um, the survival rate of the bacteria because this is what it is made for. Uh, I have not that much information about the, the sorting itself. This is the Moflo Atrios uh, equalizer cell sorter from Beckman Coulter. So you can find it online and you can find for some more information about it uh, online. Now, uh, there are a few other questions. So do you have any problems in a nozzle of facts due to oil phase? What factors we need to take care during sorting? Um, do you have any problem in nozzle of facts due to oil phase? Um, well, we did not. Uh, well, the, the, the trouble that we experienced uh, was not in the nozzle uh, of facts. In some cases, when your shell is too big, you might have some uh, sedimentation. So it will be a bit more difficult to have a uh, smooth flow inside uh, your flow cytometer, but uh, we did not really have uh, issues with the, no with the nozzle. Uh, what you can take care during sorting, so that would be the cell sedimentation. You can test um, various uh, surfactants, various solutions in your, in your double emulsions to make sure that you have uh, your double emulsion in suspensions and that uh, it's compatible, uh, it's easy to, uh, to load in your flow cytometer. Uh, I would say also maybe know the, know the diameter of your nozzle uh, in your fax, because if, the, if you have a 75 micrometers nozzles, you might want to work with a double emulsion of around 30 micrometers as we did. If you have like a 200 or 300 micrometer nozzle, you can work with larger double emulsions, which can be maybe easier to make. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the main thing. It's have, uh, making double emulsions that are compatible with uh, your fax nozzle size. Um, now, uh, we have another question and thank you for asking that many questions. How long were these double emulsions stable? Uh, okay, we know for sure uh, that uh, at least uh, 10 days after production, they were still stable. 
uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this customer case study in this specific study here in other studies uh, that I am performing with other people uh, I uh, we noticed that up to three or four weeks it was uh, there was still stable now uh, what is the material of the microfluidic chip and how to clean it to avoid cross-contamination? Thank you, Dario, for this question. Um, so the microfluidic chip, the nozzle is made of resin, uh, but uh, we know that it is not compatible with everything. So it, was, it will be compatible with oil, with water, um, PBS, um, culture media and basic solvents such as isopropanol, ethanol. But it's true that in the case of uh, some solvent, it can be incompatible. This is why we are also proposing a version with uh, when uh, where the, um, the chip would be made in glass. And that will be compatible with almost everything. Uh, and the last question that we have is, how are the sorted droplets collected for further analysis and how to remove oil phase for further processing of uh, collected bacteria? Um, okay. Uh, you can uh, collect your double emulsions uh, in various ways. You can collect them in uh, tubes and they will they will remove shaped as double emulsions and you can do whatever you want on them you can also for example in the case of bacteria you can collect them on petri dishes uh, for example one uh, double emulsion at uh, for every spot and this way you can start a new bacterial culture with with just uh, bacteria of interest uh, this way, you do not have to remove oil. You can just have uh, your uh, your um, your bacterial cultures and your spots, and you can just sample your bacteria here after uh, a small bacterial growth. Uh, in the case of cells, for example, well, you can collect your double emulsion double emulsions and then uh, destabilize them using either some chemicals or some electrostatics gun. Uh, there are several ways to destabilize an emulsion and get uh, rid of the oil phase. Um, once you destabilize your, uh, your oil phase, you will have two phases, one with the oil and the other one with your liquid containing your uh, cells or bacteria, and you can just pipe it uh, the oil out of your tube. Uh, one thing again, uh, I realized that I uh, forgot to answer one part of the question. So um, who was it? Uh, uh, Dario asked how to clean uh, the microfluidic chip to avoid cross-contamination. Um, okay, so first you, you can clean it by injecting ethanol in the core phase, for example, and uh, to, to clean uh, the nozzle. Uh, if, if necessary, you can perform uh, stronger cleanings uh, uh, by opening the chip and really rinsing everything with ethanol. You can also uh, perform some um, ultrasonic baths. So there are several ways of cleaning it and if you're interested in it uh, we have some videos on our website uh, on which we explain how to clean the, the chip so uh, if you want more information on it you can directly contact us and I, I will send you some some videos and some information on how to clean it um, so do we have other question? doesn't seem so. So th thank you all for all these questions and for, for your participation. I hope that you enjoyed this, uh, this webinar. Uh, again, if you have other questions coming to your mind, uh, feel free to, to come back to us and we will be pleased to answer them. Uh, and here we are. So 
this is the end of uh, this session. So uh, have all a great day or a great evening. And um, we are looking forward to hearing for you all. Uh, yes.